Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Uh, so we begin today's session. I, I just have yeah. yeah. Okay. With uh, Janko Bull talking about uh, IBP identities for Feynman integrals. Thank you very much and thank you for the opportunity to talk at this nice conference, at this very nice place. And what I will talk about is um, what computer algebra can do um, for your problems in um, physics and in particular what new methods for massively parallel computations can do for you. So that is something which is um, an old thing in scientific computing and numerics, but it's a quite new thing for computer algebra. And I will um, describe a little bit um, um, what computer algebra can offer you there. I will talk shortly about a couple of classical problems, which are also relevant in particular for this intersection theory method. And um, then I will give a short outline how we apply this to, um, to IBP reduction. And I'm um, young in the afternoon will go into more details of the physics on that topic. And time permitting, I will say a few words on another topic which in actually involves intersection theory also and Feynman integrals and is a mathematical topic from mirror symmetry. Yeah, so <coughs> I'm from Kaiserslautern and we developed this computer algebra system Singular. It's an open source system and it's for polynomial computations. You can say for commutative algebra. And we have a lot of development teams contributing also to the system. It was founded by Gerd Martin Greul, um, which you perhaps know as a long term director of this Oberwolfach Institute, Gerhard Pfister and Hans Schönemann, the current head is Wolfram Decker. And um, the features include, first of all, Gröbner bases over various fields or the integers. Um, free resolutions, computations in local rings, um, normalization, which is a process which improves singularities, primary decomposition, which I think this thing, does it still work? Yeah. Um, primary decomposition, which is a version of integer factorization, but for algebraic varieties, we have invariant theory, we have non-commutative um, methods if you want to compute an annihilator of an operator and stuff like that, if you want to compute with differential forms. And of course, all that um, gets mirrored on the geometric side to algebraic geometry and also tropical geometry more recently. So we can classify singularities. So if you have critical points, of course, it matters what kind of structure does this critical point have, right? You can't just count the critical point. Um, so that you can do, you can um, resolve singularities, you can do deformation theory, you can do sheaf cohomology, Dirham cohomology, um, you can do rational parameterizations as far as they exist, you can do um, tropicalization, which is um, converting algebraic geometry into a kind of um, combinatorial version, you have some algorithms from um, geometric invariant theory. So there's all kinds of stuff. There's about 150 libraries nowadays. And um, the basis of all is um, methods for non-linear algebra. So you all know Gauss algorithm. You all know the Euclidean algorithm for computing a GCD. <coughs> and if you combine these two ideas, you get what's called Buchberger's algorithm to compute Gröbner bases. And um, if you think of a GCD, of course, the main operation is division with remainder. So if you have now polynomials in more than one variable, it's of course not clear how to do division with remainder. So you have to um, fix what is called a monomial ordering. You can order your monomials just like you would write them in a lexicon or in different other ways. And then you can do a division, right? And say I take this polynomial divided by these two here. 
then I will see that the division will finish with this remainder. And um, that would kind of, um, you would think, imply that you can't write that thing as a linear combination of these two polynomials. However, you can. So the ideal generated by these two polynomials contains that polynomial. And um, that is a flaw of the generating system of the ideal. So the idea is actually very easy. It makes the generating system larger. You don't change the ideal. So you will just add that thing as an other generator to your ideal. And if you then do the division according to this new generating system, you, of course, get 0. And the result is what you call a Gröbner basis. So um, that solves what's called the ideal membership problem. So the division with remainder gives 0 if and only if um, the thing you divide is in the given ideal, provided you divide by a Gröbner basis. So that is the main computational workhorse. There's other things like factorization algorithms. and. Um, these Gröbner bases can be used for a lot of stuff. You can eliminate variables. You um, can um, f intersect ideas or modules. You can compute polynomial relations, syzygies, we call these. Um, you can compute ideal quotients, um, saturations. And you do all that kind of birational geometry, for example, what you need for resolving singularities, as we have discussed already yesterday, that is something which is relevant to the module intersection, uh, to, uh, to the intersection theory um, method. If you want to know more about these algorithms, there's this book of Groll and Pfister, um, which is a nice reference. You can also try Singular out online. Um, so you can just go to the web page and see here some example sessions. So Singular will also be available soon as a cornerstone of a new open source computer algebra system called OSCAR, which is developed in our um, um, transregional um, Sonderforschungsbereich. And um, so that combines Singular with other open source systems for number theory, group theory, and polyhedral geometry. And the unifying language is um, a new language called um, Julia, rather recent language, which has a lot of nice features. For example, it can do just-in-time compilation of code. So let me discuss a little bit this resolution of singularities. So this. Um, was a big result um, by Hironaka. He got a Fields Medal. And yeah, so um, if you look into his proof, he uses what is called a so called order sequence. So this is a sequence of vanishing orders of a Gröbner basis, but in a local setting, a standard basis. And um, he proved the existence of resolution of singularities in characteristic zero and characteristic P. It's still an open problem. And um, so if you look at this um, criterion, of course, you have to check it at every um, point, right? Um, and there are infinitely many points. But you can easily turn this into an effective criterion, for example, to test smoothness in the first place, but also then to resolve singularities. And um, what happens there is that you um, work with um, the Sariski topology, so you look at complements of zero sets of algebraic equations that are your open sets. And then um, you iteratively go to smaller open sets, and you get a covering um, in form of a tree of charts. And here you see already parallelism coming into the game, right? Because there are a lot of leaves usually in such a tree of charts. So we um, developed a smoothness test based on that idea and based on um, algorithmic versions of resolution of singularities, which I will discuss in a second a bit. And yeah, so that writes actually every smooth variety as a um, 
locally as a smooth um, complete intersection. So for example, if you take these three equations, they define a curve in projective three space. So it's one equation too much, right? As you, more than you would expect. But if you go to an appropriate open subset, it's a complete intersection of two equations and you see the two hypersurfaces and the curve is this black thing, right? So if you project this curve um, to some directions, then you will see that you obtain singularities and there's the inverse process called blow up, um, which will replace this point by a line and then allows to resolve singularities. Um, here we still have an exceptional divisor which is tangent to this curve, so we will have to blow up further um, to get normal crossing. And that all has been made um, algorithmic, the Sionaka method, um, by a lot of different people, in particular Bravo and Sinas Villa Mayor. This is what is implemented in Singular and was implemented by Fulbis Krüger and Pfister. If you look at higher dimensional problems, you see that, of course, things become much more complicated. So you have lines of singularities which again meet in points and you have to think very carefully what to blow up um, to um, get a resolution of singularities. And again, you get such a tree of charts and that, of course, um, leads to the idea that one should traverse such a tree in a parallel way. And to draw information of that tree, of this tree of charts, you again need kind of a parallel algorithm um, which um, traverses this tree and draws some information from it. For example, the intersection matrix of the exceptional devices or whatever you're interested in. So that um, got us started to look at massively parallel methods because you can get an awful lot of charts. And yeah, so this goes in the, with the smoothness test into a couple of hundred in usual examples. And um, luckily in Kaiserslautern there is this Fraunhofer Institute um, for Industrial Mathematics and they have already a uh, ready-made um, workflow management system for massively parallel computations and that we combined with Singular. So Singular calls the system, the system calls many singulars. This is kind of the basic idea. And um, this system contains out of a, of a distributed um, runtime system, so it assigns tasks to workers. And um, it is more than that. It is also a programming environment and separates um, the computation from the actual coordination of the algorithm. So you can um, formulate your algorithm in a nice environment and um, for that we have a specialized language which is a so-called Petrinet. And um, in the computation layer, on the other hand, you can use, say, singular procedures, but you could call anything which is callable as a C library. So these Petrinet um, they were um, introduced by Karl Adam Petri um, as a graphical way to describe um, concurrent asynchronous systems. Yeah, I guess uh, the world is such a thing also, right? And um, mathematically, it's a bipartite directed graph. It has places and transitions. The places can contain tokens. Um, which you want to work on. The transitions consume tokens, produce new tokens. This is the basic idea. And the transition can fire if all input places of a transition have a token. So here's an example. Here's a token on a place. Here's a transition. Here's another place. The light is off. This is a drawing of Petri or by Petri, not of Petri. It's of his son. Um, Petri was not better computer scientists than artists. Um, so, yeah, so here's this token. The token gets consumed by the transition. The token is here, now the light is on. This is kind of the very basic idea. This transition can fire because here are tokens. You get to this here. This cannot fire because here is the token missing. All right? Um, here's my favorite example. 
um, of a real world petri net. We have uh, someone who wants to shoot someone else. Um, so we have here the assassin. So here is a token, and so the assassin has to load the gun, then the gun is loaded, so there will be a token here, the assassin pulls the trigger, fire pin is struck, you can get a misfire, or the gun fires. So this is a randomized way to execute such a Petri net. This could fire or that, so the guy could be lucky or not, right? Um, so you have to take that into account in your algorithm. It's always a randomized algorithm. Um, someone could unload the gun, the victim is shot, um, then the victim dies. So the main feature of these Petri nets is parallelism. So you can have both um, transitions which can fire in parallel if here are tokens. But what you can also do, and which is in some sense more important, if you have several tokens on such a place, you can execute the transition several times at the same time without any problems in your algorithm. If you have formulated the algorithm as a Petri net. In the real world, of course, it's a little bit more complicated. Transitions take time in the real world. Um, the tokens are not just there or not. They actually can contain data. And the transitions can actually be picky and say, I only want tokens of the following kind. But that makes the programming much easier. So we have looked so far at a couple of examples of applications. So from classical algebraic geometry, we implemented the smoothness test um, based on this Hironaka idea, resolution of singularities, um, which can handle then much bigger problems than what the current implementation, sequential implementation in singular can do. We did some algorithms from geometric invariance here. We did tropicalization, so converting an algebraic variety in this combinatorial shadow of it. Um, and we did integration by parts um, reduction. And we also applied it to another topic um, which arises from mirror symmetry on, is connected to algebraic geometry, tropical geometry, and um, string theory. So this is about generating um, series and recursions for Gromov-Witten invariance. Yeah, so let's um, quickly um, go back and think a little bit about this classical application. So parallelism in algebraic geometry, we said, comes from the use of charts. This is one source of parallelism, and it um, kind of mirrors the idea to describe um, schemes in terms of charts and glue these charts together to get a um, more complicated object and this idea of sheaves and vector bundles and so forth. And then, of course, you have want to relate global properties to local properties in the charts, and this is a non-trivial problem. Um, if you want to use this um, parallel structure on a computer, um, you um, think in the first place, and this is why people didn't do it for long, um, that it's not really possible. And the problem is that a single chart may dominate your runtime, because in every chart you will somehow run this Buchberger algorithm, and Buchberger algorithm is worst case doubly exponential, so it's not a very predictable algorithm. In many examples, it's very fast. So Meyer and Meyer showed that, that it's double exponential. And what we observed is now that if you give the algorithm um, the choice of the chart, you actually can um, get a very good algorithm out of this approach because, I mean, a given algebraic variety has a lot of covers by um, sets of charts, a lot of atlases. So um, if the algorithm can choose from a large set of charts and say test smoothness in a given chart and finish once it has covered the whole variety, then of course the fast charts will win if you have say a cluster with a thousand cores and you have not more than thousand charts, right? Um, 
And even if there are more charts, it will also work in a very nice manner. So that actually leads to a very strange thing. If you double your computational resources, you get a speed up which is much more than double. And the reason is that some computations usually would get stuck. So here is something for a so-called numerical Godot surface. It's a general type surface, co-dimension 11, which was constructed by um, Schreier and Stenger. And um, the usual Jacobi criterion, which looks at minus of the Jacobian matrix to test smoothness, is um, completely infeasible there. But um, this um, chart approach works, and you see you can, this is seconds, so you can certify smoothness in less than an hour if you use enough cores. And you see, say, here is a, you double the resources, but the speed up is much more than double. And that we see in a lot of problems, actually, um, that the algorithm can, in a massively parallel way, find um, the way to the answer better if you kind of give it the freedom to do that. So let me come to the integrations by parts um, reduction. So I mean the setup we have seen now a couple of times. We have some um, Feynman diagram. We have some Feynman integral. Um, the variables are connected through impulse conservation. We have some external variables, some internal variables. Um, we go to the Spikov representation, and then we have a couple of external parameters um, for this um, um, graph here. It's five, and um, then we have um, various integrations to do. And um, yeah, now you can basically write any integral as a linear combination of integrals of this monomial type. And um, of course, there is an awful lot of monomials. So we want to, to have these integration by parts identities to relate um, these integrals. So um, as we have also seen a couple of times, um, you um, do such a total derivative and get these identities. And what we do now is we um, impose some more conditions to get only physically relevant integration by parts identities. So we want to avoid shifts in the dimension parameter, and we want to retain that these um, exponents are less or equal than um, zero. So that translates into such an equation, which in algebraic geometry is known as a syzygy equation. So this is a syzygy between partial derivatives of the spike of polynomial, modulo the polynomial, and it translates in such equations. And if you have now such an integration by parts identity, it's such a vector of a's. And um, first of all, the two conditions separately are relatively easy to handle. So we have shown that um, this, um, in this um, paper, that um, the syzygy equation can be solved by Laplace expansion. And so we know um, this condition here. And it's a module membership. Remember, it's like this ideal membership I talked about at the beginning. And the second condition you can also easily formulate as a module membership. And now you want to satisfy both conditions, so you intersect these two modules, compute up to a certain degree. So this is the use of nonlinear algebra for this IPP problem via Gröbner basis, because this intersection is computed using Gröbner basis. And then if we write down um, the possible IPPs up to a certain bound, um, then we need a reduction algorithm. So we do a semi-numeric reduction. So we replace some of the parameters by um, constants. And um, Young will talk more about that stuff. So I will just quickly go over that. And um, then we interpolate the parameters, which we replaced by numbers. So for, we could, for example, handle this non-planar hexagon box with this approach. 
Um, but of course, what you see is you need massively parallel methods. And for this computation, we did it more or less by hand on the cluster. Um, for um, this um, non-planar um, double pentagon thing, um, we um, um, then used this um, GPI-space approach, which makes life much more easy and um, speeds up matters very much. So um, just to give you an idea how this corresponding Petri net executed by GPI space using singular looks like, um, this is such a, the, basically the reduction and interpolation step. Um, so we do, do a full pivoting. Um, we find the degrees of the respective variables by univariate reduction, symbolic univariate reduction. And we dynamically replace bad points in the reduction. <coughs> we have here a so-called interpolation tree data structure which controls the state of the interpolation. And the leaves of that tree are essentially the final results. So we fill out this tree um, iteratively. And um, if we have a sufficient number of interpolation points, then we trigger the next interpolation of the next variant. So, um, that you can find in this paper. To give you an idea how um, that thing um, scales, um, here is um, the number of cores um, we use for, um, so this is for one of the um, um, 11 cuts. Um, the easiest, actually, because otherwise you can't analyze the scaling because it won't finish on one core, right? So, and you see the speed up is, keeps up quite well with the number of cores. And if you divide by the number of cores, you get what's called the parallel efficiency, and this is in a very good range for parallel algorithms. Um, if you start out here with the parallel efficiency, you can actually compute a um, kind of um, theoretical idea how much percentage of your algorithm is parallel, how much is sequential. And this is this um, purple curve here, and you see the actual speed up um, keeps very well um, with this um, parallel efficiency, which you would theoretically expect. So that is the easiest of these um, cuts, um, finishes in 10 minutes on 384 cores. Um, they are more difficult ones they take in the range of hours. So you can, if you have used enough cores, you can finish this computation in a day or two. Yeah, and this involves in interpolation up to degrees, something like 35 in that range. So, how much time do I have left? Question to the... Um, ten minutes. <coughs> ten minutes. Okay. So, I can say a little bit something about um, the other um, topic we are working on, which involves Feynman integrals, and I think also um, is related to this intersection theory question. So, this comes from mirror symmetry, which looks at so-called so Calabi-Yau varieties. So, one-dimensional Calabi-Yau is an elliptic curve. Um, you have seen these for sure. And um, then there is this famous quintic and projective four space. And then people are interested in a mirror construction. So you have to collapse, you have a mirror. And to both of them, you can associate what's called the A and the B model. And the A model are so called Grom of Witten invariants. And these are intersection numbers on the modular space of stable maps. of certain genus or a number of points of a certain degree. So think of, say, curves in the plane through a given number of points of a certain degree. Something like that. But now not in the plane, but in the Calabria. And um, the B model uh, arises through Feynman integrals. And um, this side is um, very well understood. The mirror constructions um, come from physics and also from mathematics. Um, the string theory um, picture is also very well understood. Um, this here um, is understood in terms of algebraic and symplectic geometry um, by these people. 
Here, it's not so totally clear um, what is going on here on this Feynman integral side. And um, the first mirror theorem was um, by Giventhal and Leo, Leo and Yao. So this was for this quintic hypersurface, and it's for um, genus zero. So genus is the number of loops in the graph, right? So um, what you get is a generating series um, which encodes certain gram of witten invariants, which actually you can interpret as numbers of lines and conics and cubics and so forth on your um, Calabi-Yau variety. So it is very um, geometric idea and um, the algebraic geometry people computed these numbers but they had a couple of them they had wrong so the physicists told them listen here something doesn't fit really with our idea um, so they fixed it and I mean there are some theorems um, on higher genus um, problems and um, the question is of course can you produce mirror theorems um, for arbitrary genus so arbitrary loop order. And um, can you understand the mirror theory, um, mirror theorem um, beyond um, just the combinatorial identity of numbers? And of course, what are these um, B model integrals actually? So we said, OK, we are not so ambitious. So we started out with elliptic curves. This is the easiest Calabiao. And here, in fact, the gram of witten invariants have a very nice interpretation. They are Hurwitz numbers, so this is a weighted, these gram of witten invariants are a weighted number of degree d covers of the elliptic curve by some other curve of a certain genus with a certain number of ramification points, according to this riemann hurwitz formula. Of course, genus zero is not an option here because there are no um, such maps from a uh, um, genus zero curve to an elliptic curve, which is a genus one curve. So we had to look at higher genus. And um, to understand that, we um, passed through this tropical geometry. So this is this combinatorial version of algebraic geometry, which essentially, if you think of an elliptic curve, this is, um, in the differential point of view, it's just a torus, right? And what you do is you shrink that to a circle in tropical geometry. So a tropical elliptic curve is just a circle. And then you can take a detour, or rather probably a shortcut through tropical geometry. So you have also tropical chrom of witten invariants. You have a correspondence theorem, which tells you that these two kinds of invariants are equal. And these um, 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 B model integrals, they relate very nicely to the tropical picture. So this whole idea um, goes um, back to um, Gross and Siebert. Um, so Mark Gross had a result for P2, which you can think of as a building block of a calabi -Yau. So you can piece together a calabi -Yau surface out of um, several P2s. But the piecing together is still kind of a mystery in many situations. And um, so we refine this whole idea a little bit for this elliptic curve. Um, by um, making a finer version of mirror symmetry, which implies the mirror symmetry you are interested in. And we also extended it further. Um, so in general, a Feynman graph for us is a three-valent connected graph of a given genus. And um, we have extended this now for higher uh, valencies and also for genus at the vertices of the graph. So you can think in the point on this graph there's a substructure. Yeah, so um, this is such an example. So there are no external legs, right, in our picture. And um, then on the Feynman integral side, we also have a propagator, which is a Weierstrass p function. We assign this propagator. So how much minutes are left? Four. Five. Good. Yeah, that's good. Um, so we have um, this propagator, which is a Weierstrass p function. This is 1 over set squared, but then you must make it periodic on your elliptic curve, which is a torus. So you can think of it as C modular lattice. And yeah, so 
the integration then happens through parallel paths on this torus. So you identify that, that, and that, and that, and you get a torus, and there are your integration paths. Um, your, the integration variables are, in our setting, the vertices of the Feynman um, graph. And um, then we have these tropical Hurwitz numbers, which is this tropical analog of the classical Hurwitz numbers, um, without going into much detail. If you have such a tropical cover, it comes with a certain multiplicity, so you have to count these covers with this multiplicity. And the cover is essentially a metric map between graphs. Um, so the graphs have lengths on the edges, and if you normalize the length in the target to one, you see that you can encode everything in weights of the edges. So if you want to count these covers now, um, then um, this is kind of a little bit of a um, problem because you always miss something. And there the Feynman integrals come into the game. So the first thing we proved is that actually these um, invariants, the classical and the tropical ones, agree by actually a correspondence of covers. So from a tropical cover, you can make an algebraic cover. The map is kind of inclusion reversing. So the components here are the vertices here, and the edges tell you how the components intersect on the algebraic side. And if you want to compute that stuff now, say you want genus 3, degree 3 maps um, to your elliptic curve. Um, then you see you have two graphs which can contribute. Graphs with bridges can't contribute. They give zero. You can show that. Then you see, okay, I can count this, and I add it up with these multiplicities, and I get this number. It's 160. Yeah, but you always forget something. So it's nice that you can compute actually the not only the number but actually the cover from the Feynman integral. So we take this product of propagators just as done in physics, and we do this integration. And um, then, essentially, we evaluate the integral by uh, residue computation. And so we look at a certain coefficient in a, a power series expansion of our product of propagators. In fact, of course, these are generating series um, of propagators in some sense. So there's a formal power series variable, and we have one for each edge. And if you put all these queues to one single queue, you get this um, classical result back. So we have this more refined version where you um, have these, this multivariate setting in the queues, and you fix not the degree, but um, how often um, the um, edges come over a base point with which multiplicities. And um, then we get this um, refined. Um, version of mirror symmetry, which implies the one which was already known for the elliptic curve um, by the work of d graph. Yeah, so to compute the Feynman integrals, you write down your propagators in the right coordinate system. This generating series of propagators looks like that. Um, so you can look at the respective coefficients of this q, this a is I'm um, counting these multiplicities of these edges, so to say the degree. Um, and then you can evaluate these tropical um, Hurwitz numbers just by looking at constant coefficients in the product of propagators. In fact, these um, generating series one can show are um, quasi modular, so you can write them as an element in the algebra generated by this Eisenstein series, E2, E4, E6, and they are of uniform weight, of a certain weight, depending on the on degree, uh, on the genus of the graph. And um, yeah, for example, for that graph, you will see that this generating series um, is um, of weight 12. In, so it uh, can be written in these monomials. So what we do is, with our massively parallel method, we compute this generating series to high enough order. Then we solve a linear system of equations to write the generating series in times of the Eisenstein series. And then you can compute that thing to arbitrary high order, yeah? because you have kind of a recursion for your um, coefficients. Yeah? You just evaluate this element. Okay, 
Uh, that's what I wanted to tell. I think I should be in time. Yes, you are. Thank you. of parametric annihilators, does this also paralyze in an efficient way? So this is a non-commutative computation, right? Yeah. So um, there's no parallelism for that yet. Um, I mean, there's also no parallelism for the Buchberger algorithm yet, except if you use linear algebra methods. But of course, if the individual computation finishes and you want to do a lot of them, you can do that in parallel, right? But I mean, this is something we are um, thinking about. Um, because it, of course, apply, appears in a lot of problems that you want to also solve these nonlinear systems of, of equations in the end in a, in a parallel way. Because at some point, the individual computation becomes the bottleneck, especially if you do non-commutative computations, which tend to be um, very complicated. I may have missed uh, uh, the point, but thank you for your nice talk. Uh, um, I was wondering whether uh, can you use uh, any alternative of uh, integration by parts identities or tropical integration by parts identities in the, in this set of calculation? Have you? Uh, so you uh, mean in the in the yes. second topic yes, I talked about? Topic. This is exactly a question which I have for you because of course I was thinking about how do these um, two things relate, right? Mm -hmm. I don't really understand how these two things relate. The second thing is clearly related to intersection theory in, in some way on these moduli spaces. And um, there should also be some integration by parts identities and stuff like that. It can be that the example is simply still too simple um, that you can see something really, really meaningful. But I mean, it's a multivariate integration. Um, it's for arbitrary genus, so it, there should be something to see, but I don't know. Okay. That's my, why I talked about it, because I hope for someone saying, ah, um, I understand okay. something there. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. I have one. This is one even on, yeah, okay. So you had this CCG equation on one of your slides. Mm -hmm. So if we can maybe go to it. Yep. Something is broken in your like, page counting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't sure whether we get to the second part depending on how okay. many questions there are. So I would have skipped it. Uh, CCG equation. Where is the CCG? Here. Yeah, yeah. yeah that one. That thing. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So we agree that A and B are the unknowns, so to speak, unknown functions. Yes. yes. And what you can do is to find expressions for A and B that makes this, this equation true. Exactly. Okay. So you can just use Schreier's algorithm for computing CCGs. What you two yeah. have done if that derivative, which is now working on P, which is known, so it's easy. If that instead have been working on your unknown, like on one of the A's, could uh, you still have had, I mean, then it's no longer a CCG equation in the no, standard no. form. No. But can your code still help with that kind of stuff? Mm, I'm not sure whether one can, what one can do with that. One would have to see the explicit um, problem. So, so if you can show me. I guess your question is, suppose there's an inverse question, so the thing is, suppose you know this kind of A, you try to find this P, isn't it? Uh, is that your question? Is that the question? No. No, I don't think so. But I was thinking about P, which yeah. should be known initially, but you just, I mean, maybe you have some combination of A's, 
on some terms and derivative of the same ace on other terms. Uh, but here we only have the derivative. You mean to add some? I, I can write down. An oh, okay, okay. Ah, sorry, I, I mean, I, I understand yeah. what you mean. So you mean you have some? I mean, this is a kind of a kernel of the vector of partial derivatives, right? This is what it is. Okay, we compute modulo p, but this is the kernel in a quotient ring, right? And if you know the a's, we know the b's. So what you ask now is basically, um, you have some more components, um, which are unknown in some sense, right? So that gives you, of course, more, more freedom. Um, I would say probably too much freedom, right? Then you could do anything in these components. Um, so I, I'm not sure whether I understand what is the questions. We probably have to have a look later. Talk about 